everyone. Thank you for joining us for this presentation about past theory and the Cognitive Assessment System Second Edition, which will be presented by Jack Naglieri. Dr. Naglieri is a research professor at the Curry School of Education at the University of Virginia, emeritus professor at George Mason University, and senior research scientist at the Devereaux Center for Resilient Children. So we certainly have a very uh, knowledgeable expert here to present. Um, thank you, thank you, Doc, Dr. Naglieri, and take it away. Thank you so much. I, I, again, I want to thank you, uh, Francie, for making this happen, and, and I'm very pleased to be able to be here to talk about my work on past theory and cognitive assessment system. And just as um, just as we get started, you see that I have my my Gmail account and my website here on this first page. And I'm happy to share the information today, but also in the future. So if this is being used by uh, professors um, in the months or years to come, you can always be in touch with me if you want me to zoom in and do a little follow-up. So uh, it's a lot of fun for me. Um, in terms of resources, there's a lot of information on my website. Nothing on my website costs anything. It's completely free. Copies of my articles, today's handout, there, there's a PDF of today's handout in the today's handout section, <laughs> obviously. Um, I have a lot of case studies. We've written a lot of short little pieces, uh, 10 minute solutions like on dyslexia, for example and um, article library and videos. And we're actually launching a, a, a lot of uh, online uh, webinars like this so people can access and just get more information. Um, I will be talking about the various uh, tests as we go and measures and books as we go uh, through today. But I like to start by telling you like the conclusions because I think it gives you a better idea of the big picture. So in my past theory, this is the simultaneous processing uh, instruction that I'm giving you, the big picture. And so here's the big picture, a couple of things. First of all, as psychologists, one of the most important things that we do is a comprehensive assessment. And make no mistake about it, comprehensive assessment that you do will change a person's life. That's not an exaggeration. And that means this is really, really important. And if you think about particularly an intellectual assessment part of a comprehensive assessment, because obviously comprehensive means you look at personality and social issues and background and on and on and on and on, but we're just going to focus on the intellectual part. What do we really want from that intellectual part? But we want it to be consistent with IDEA. So for example, um, IDEA defines a learning disability as a disorder in one or more basic psychological processes. Well, that means you should measure those. That means you should use a test that actually is designed to measure basic psychological processes. We certainly want to understand why a student fails. That's critically important because unless we know why, we don't really know what to do. We don't really know what to tell the teacher. We might have answers, but they may not be really the answer. And we really want to look at academic and cognitive strengths and weaknesses, the academic and the intellectual processes, and uh, uh, weak strengths and weaknesses should, should be consistent. We'll talk a lot about that. And not last but least, but last but maybe most, important, our tools have to be fair. And by fair, I mean, I mean not just psychometrically not biased, but also from the concept of equity. And I'll talk about that as we go through. So what I'm gonna really talk about today is what I like to describe as second generation of ability tests. You know, you have the WISC, you have the Binet, the differential ability scales, the Woodcock cognitive, um, in some ways the KBC, but really the KBC 
is more like my cognitive assessment system. This is the second generation. When Kaufman's first started to talk about the KBC, they said, we know what the whisk is, we wanna do it different. And that's what I did with my friend and colleague, JP Das. But the key is this, with the, with, with the, with the cognitive assessment system, we wanna measure the way students think to learn. We're gonna be talking a lot about that. And thinking should be defined on the basis of brain function. And so we have the PASS theory, which is a way of defining thinking in the cognitive assessment system as a way of measuring the student's ability to think. So all this stuff needs to be connected. And that's, that's the, those are the basic conclusions. And now I'm gonna help you understand all the details and how we got here and do it in, uh, in 81 minutes, if that right. So, um, it might surprise you to know that um, I actually became very interested in how ch people learn in my first profession, which was not psychology at all. Um, I was a professional musician. And I started playing professionally when I was 17. This was the first band I was ever in. This is um, a couple of years before I grew my beard. And um, one of the things I realized was when I taught guitar, which I did a lot of, using the same books and the same instruction. Some kids got it, some kids didn't. And I was really puzzled, like, why is that? So I tried to find out, um, but didn't really get a clear answer. When I went off to undergraduate school, I really resonated with psychology, especially courses on learning, whether it was animal learning or human learning, uh, notwithstanding. So then I started, uh, after I, got my school psych certificate. I started working as a school psychologist and I noticed something really weird. I was working at this school, Charles Champaign Elementary in Bethpage, New York, where I was living, near where I was living. And I noticed that a lot of the questions on the WISC were just like the questions on the achievement test. There was an information subtest on the WISC. There was an information subtest on the Peabody Individual Achievement Test. There was a vocabulary test in both place, places. Sometimes the questions were virtually identical. It didn't make any sense to me, but I didn't know enough to know to say, it's not that it didn't make any sense. What I should have been saying is it's wrong. I say that today. It's wrong. I'm gonna explain that some more. Now, after I, um, after I got my PhD at the University of Georgia, I started my first job in Arizona. And I went to a, a lecture, like within the first month I was there, on Native American Navajos by a geneticist. And I thought, well, this guy must really know what he's talking about, right? Well, he started talking, talking, and the more I listened to him, the more concerned I got, because he was saying, you know, the Native American Navajos, their left brains aren't as well developed as their right brains, because when you live on the desert, you have to have good spatial skills, and that's the right part of your brain, and the whisk measures the right part with, your, with the nonverbal test, and on and on and on. And then I, I started to think, I said, that's ridiculous. They don't speak English very well. Well, of course they're not gonna get a high score on a verbal scale. So on my first paper, on this topic was, does the WISCAR really measure verbal intelligence for non-English speaking children? The answer obviously was no. Sometimes we miss the obvious. And this is where I really got interested in fair assessment. 1982, my first paper, my first test, the matrix analogies test was all about that. My first book on gifted was all about fair assessment. Um, all the different iterations of my first test, they became the Naglieri Nonverbal, now the third edition. And I've actually published more than a dozen tests, and all of these tests had equity in them. Because we really need to do a better job. So what I'm trying to do here is take you from a place where you might be to another place in terms of your understanding. And I just want to play this great quote by Neil deGrasse Tyson. Give this a listen. 
One of the great challenges in this world is knowing enough about a subject to think you're right, but not enough about the subject to know you're wrong. Think about that. Sometimes you have to know something so well and see it more realistically. And that's what I want to help you with today. So let's just step back for a second, just a couple of, couple of uh, a minute or so. Why do we measure intelligence the way we do? Well, it's because of these guys. Thorndike, Otis of Otis Lennon, Woodworth. These men were responsible the development of the Army Alpha and the Army Beta tests published in 1917, more than a hundred years ago. And that really was the foundation of the Wexler scales. Because Wexler was an, an examiner for the US military and he gave the Army Alpha and the Army Beta which became his verbal IQ and performance IQ. The problem is the verbal tests required lots and lots of, of language and knowledge. The nonverbal part, the beta tests, measure more thinking. The verbal tests really measure more knowledge. And this is really the foundation of all the group and individually administered traditional IQ tests, WISC, the DAS, the WJ, the COGAT, the Otis Lennon, they all have this fundamental flaw. And in this slide, I show all the different subtests from all these different instruments that we use all the time. We decide how smart somebody is on the basis of how many words they can define. Does that really make sense? or how well they can do quantitative you know, word, math word problems or verbal analogies. Or I, even on the, the, the Woodcock, um, auditory processing, phonological processing. This doesn't make any sense to me. And if you go back and you read like the writings in the early 70s, like this book that Joe Matarazzo uh, published, Matarazzo worked a lot with Wexler, I've known Joe for a long time, he's an amazing man. Even he said, look, vocabulary is influenced by educational opportunities. Arithmetic subtests, well, of course that's influenced by education. And then why did we have the nonverbal tests? These are what they look like, object assembly, coding. Why did we have them? On page 19, of the Oakham and Yerkes book on the Omni Mental Testing Program, they explicitly say men who fail in alpha, that's the achievement kind of tests, are sent to beta, the nonverbal, in order that injustice by reason of unfamiliarity with English may be avoided. There's no talk about measuring verbal intelligence or nonverbal intelligence. They really saw the nonverbal test as a way of managing this social justice issue. And especially in our world today, with all the stuff that's going on with the Black Lives Matter and all the you know, social upheaval about fairness for everyone, this is something we need to pay more attention to. We were told this a hundred years ago but I never learned it in any of my training programs. Alan Kalpin was my teacher at the University of Georgia. He was the first one who said the verbal side of the WISC could also be considered an achievement test. And he was right. The tests that we have kind of on a continuum. Um, so the achievement tests on the right-hand side and the ability tests that don't involve achievement on the leftmost side. And the stuff in the middle is where you get misled. 
like a Wilcock Johnson, or Otis Lenn and a Kogat, a Whisk, you get misled. You think they're not so smart, but it's just that they haven't had opportunity, even if they only speak English. So with the cognitive assessment system, the Lexa Nonverbal, which I am the author of, um, my test of general ability, Bruce Bracken and Steve McCallum's test, the unit, um, Don Hamill has a, a nonverbal matrices test. These are the kinds of tests that measure thinking. And that's where we need to recognize we can do better.